Today we have a talk by uh, Tim Brandt, who is going to talk to us about combining multiple ways of direct of uh, exoplanet uh, discoveries. And I think it's going to be a very interesting talk. Um, Tim did his PhD at Princeton and has since then moved to the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And I am really excited to hear about your talk today. So you're welcome to take it away. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm delighted to be speaking to you today. Um, I do wish I could come. It is tricky to come to Arizona from Santa Barbara and I'm a little constrained in my travel options these days uh, with uh, a young child. So um, I'm delighted to talk to you today and I hope that there are questions, discussions, and um, I will try not to fill the entire hour so that we do have some time towards the end. So I think this is a fairly exoplanet focused audience. So I don't think I need to talk to you about the background of exoplanets, why they're interesting, the different ways of detecting them. But I do want to briefly give you a uh, hopefully visceral case of why direct imaging is an interesting approach, even if it's been more challenging than transits and radio velocities thus far. So my pitch for this is that transits and radio velocities give you um, power through numbers. And so if you look at an article about how many hundreds or thousands of planets have been discovered, then it's amazing. But what we really get is something like this. You have two planets that are discovered by transit. You know how big they are. That's it. Maybe you know the environment around the star in which they exist, but you haven't really learned about the nature of the planets themselves, not unless you can actually pull off something like transit spectroscopy, which is possible for a much more limited subset of planets and lets you probe the outer parts of their atmosphere. Radial velocity just gives you a number, the mass subject to an uncertain inclination, along with some details about the orbit. If you put those two together, well, you know how massive it is, you know how big it is. If something transits, then you probably also have a very good idea about the inclination, so that part is also removed. But somehow, having this, a couple of circles where I can draw them the correct size and write a number in there about the mass, is much less viscerally powerful than an image, where you can see that Venus and Earth are very, very different worlds. And so that's the power of direct imaging. Not, unfortunately, to resolve the surfaces of the planets, but to collect photons from those worlds and to understand what they're like. That's what we've been selling in the direct imaging community for years and years. And that's um, why we think that these um, discoveries are, in some ways, more valuable than an individual transit or RV discovery and why they continue to have their place and will have an increasing place in the exoplanet ecosystem. So direct imaging around other stars is hard. Around our own sun, it would have been hard if it weren't for the fact that we have a very nice coronagraph oh, yeah, 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 um, in place, which is our own planet. To give you an idea of why it's so hard, this gap between the sun and Jupiter, these are very, very rough curves for the um, emission of these objects, differ by about a factor of a billion which is roughly the contrast between an entire floodlit stadium and a single firefly. And they're separated in the sky by um, usually about an arc second or less. Um, and an arc second itself is optimistic only around the nearest stars. On Earth, we can find these planets easily enough by waiting um, for a natural coronagraph to work for us, by waiting for nighttime. During the day, it's hard because you have to pick something out against this very, very bright background. But the Earth blocks the sun, and at night, things are nice and clear. For exoplanets, we don't have that trick. And so the fact that the planets are so many orders of magnitude fainter than the star, on Earth, we get around that by waiting for nighttime. Um, around another star, we don't have that luxury. But what people realized about 30 years ago is that that factor of 10 to the nine doesn't have to be quite that bad. If you're talking about a Jupiter, not as it appears today, 
after it's been cooling for four and a half billion years. But as it was when it was young, when it still possessed residual heat of formation, when the gravitation, gravitational potential energy um, wasn't yet largely radiated away, then maybe it looked something like this. This is a synthetic spectrum. I don't remember the model. And at a few million years, something like Jupiter in the near infrared might be a factor of 10 to the five or so fainter than its star. And so those are the systems that we have been going after with direct imaging, the young planets. All right, so I will touch very briefly on my own introduction to this direct imaging field, which was the seed survey, um, which took place Ah, oh, Jesus, started more than 10 years ago now. But it was a big survey at the time, and it was one of several of its kind. Uh, there was the Gemini D Planet Survey. There was a follow-up campaign on Nikki. There were campaigns on NACO on the VLT. All in all, several groups around the world used a huge amount of telescope time to look for planets. So in order to pull that off, we needed to take advantage of new technological developments. The two most important ones to my mind are adaptive optics and infrared detectors. And this image to some degree shows you both. This is an infrared detector and it's an image of the core of a globular cluster. This particular image is taken under natural seeing conditions. And so you see these objects blurred out. You can also see uh, some of the artifacts of the infrared detector here, some of those vertical stripes and horizontal stripes. If you turn your adaptive optic system on, and this is not Olivier's new adaptive optic system, this is the um, AO188, AO188, it's called. It's what existed years ago. That's um, still the initial stage in Subaru. Then suddenly things look much, much sharper. If you want to pick out something faint next to something bright, then the faint things show up much, much more clearly when you can concentrate their light. The bright things reveal their faint companions when you can concentrate the light of the bright things and potentially also remove it in hardware using a coronagraph. So um, what we actually do is not look at an image like this to look for a faint thing next to a bright thing, but we take advantage of the fact that um, the positions of objects on the sky uh, are very distinct from positions of diffraction uh, artifacts that are imparted by our own optics. So that's a view of the sky. And this is showing you um, a zoomed in view of that field where I apologize for the slightly garish color scheme, but this is showing the particular um, image of a star through our um, adaptive optic system and through a coronagraph. You see all these little diffraction spots um, and that spot in the middle is just an artifact of how the detector behaves. And then there's this blob to the right. So is that blob to the right an unusually bright diffraction speckle or is it a companion, in this case, a stellar companion? What we do to actually tell is we rotate the telescope relative to the field and that will rotate the diffraction pattern relative to a companion. In space, you do this by rolling your telescope. On the ground, you do it by waiting patiently while the Earth turns and does this for you, at least if you have an Aldaz telescope. Looks something like this. And now it's extremely clear that the diffraction pattern is rotating, but that blob on the side is a real companion. So I'm glossing over a huge amount of work that we did, and there's a similar amount of work that other groups did. Um, in order to reveal these planets next to their stars at roughly that 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 level I was saying earlier. At the end of the day, we had a fair number of papers, but a lot of them were of these disks, which wasn't the flagship um, science program that was this program was supposed to do. Uh, the goal was to find the planets that were causing these kinds of structures in the disks. And on the lower right, I'm showing you two companions. Depending on your perspective, you can argue about whether these should be called planets or brown dwarfs, but I don't particularly want to get into that semantic uh, argument. Uh, the point for this is that there are only two of them. And if you remember a couple slides back, we were hoping to target 500 stars. So we didn't go to uh, propose for this survey with an expected yield of two. <laughs> 
we went with a higher expected yield. So what happened? Why didn't we find more? The answer seems to be that um, these particular objects, these uh, very luminous uh, companions, are rarer than we had hoped. And so in order to find them, we need to go fainter and closer. We know there are lots of planets fainter and closer because we see them in radio velocity surveys. They're analogs of the outer solar system. So our results from seeds looked a lot like this, where we have these things called contrast curves. They show the limits of what we could have detected um, in units of luminosity I'm putting here. And even then it's not quite what we really want. We want to have something that we can physically interpret like mass. So even that requires a bit of a conversion. Assuming you have an age and a cooling model, you can put that in terms of mass limits. And you see all of these different curves. We were sensitive to companions at 50 to 100 AU, but we didn't find them. Jupiter and Saturn are down and to the left in this plot. That means they're closer in and lower mass than what we were able to image around these stars. We know these planets are there. We see them in our solar system. We see them in RV surveys. We didn't see their more massive and more distant uh, companions, at least not in the numbers we were hoping in seeds. And other people have had similar uh, results since then. So the question is, what comes next? How can we actually start to image these planets that we know exist, but we couldn't quite get there? And that's gonna lead me into the second part of my talk, which is going to talk a bit about um, two ways that I think we're going to go in this direction. I used extreme adaptive optics in the title of this talk. I am not qualified to give you a presentation on extreme adaptive optics. Um, I know Olivier is very well qualified. Uh, so hopefully you uh, have some um, opportunity to have another talk uh, at some point where uh, some of the experts on extreme AO can talk about the wonderful work that they are doing. I'm going to talk to you about two different things. An instrument that we can put behind extreme adaptive optics to take advantage of what it gives us, and astrometry, which is a newcomer to the field of exoplanetary science. Like with RV 30, 40 years ago, it's a long established technique and it hasn't been applied to exoplanets because the sensitivity hasn't been there. That sensitivity is now coming in the same way that the sensitivity in RVs came about 30 years ago or so. And so I'll talk to you about that in the last part of my talk, which is going to be a significant fraction of the total content. So I'll tell you a little bit about Keras first, which is a high contrast and field spectrograph that we have on the Subaru telescope. Um, I'll talk a bit about what exactly all of those words are. So this system, Keras, sits behind an extreme adaptive optic system. If you're familiar with G pi or sphere, it's the same idea. G pi has one of these integral field spectrographs, very similar in concept, slightly different in execution, sitting behind its own extreme adaptive optic system. Sphere likewise has its own extreme adaptive optic system, and then it has its own integral field spectrograph behind it. All three of those are lenslet based integral field spectrographs. If you picture just a camera, what a camera does is it takes um, the light coming in and images it into um, an image plane. You then put a detector in the image plane, you get a picture. An integral field spectrograph adds a couple of layers to that. Where you would have a detector in the image plane just to take a picture, instead, you put this array of lenslets. The lenslets take the light incident on each one of them and focus it down to a little point. So now what you have are a bunch of tiny little dots, each containing the light from one lenslet. If you put a detector at the lenslet focus, you would have no more information than if you actually put the detector at the lenslet plane. So you wouldn't actually be helping yourself. You just have a bunch of empty space because you focus the light into little points. What it lets you do though, is that if your detector has all this empty space in it, you can use a prism to spread out each of those little points into a little spectrum. And so, your detector will contain one spectrum corresponding to each lens slit. It then takes some work, but you can reconstruct the data cube or the image if you prefer 
at each wavelength. I'll walk you through that in uh, these images. This is what the Subaru PSF, theoretically at least, looks like in an image plane. It's just a Fourier transform of the Subaru pupil, nothing more shown in a log stretch. If I then put a lens lit array here, then what I do is I take each box in that image and I focus its light down into a little itty bitty point. Most of the image is now empty space. I then use that empty space to disperse. So now I am showing you an actual image. In the lower right, you see all of these little vertical lines with a couple of dark stripes across. Those dark stripes are windows where the atmosphere is relatively opaque between the J and H and between the H and K bands. And so you see a line with two slightly dark stripes and you see many of these lines, one for each lenslet. The task is then to reconstruct the image at each wavelength. And that looks like the following. So I'm stepping through wavelength here and showing the image of a star. The four bright spots around the outside were put there on purpose. Those are done by the extreme adaptive optics system to diffract some light from the central star, which is itself blocked. That lets us figure out exactly how bright the central star would be and where it would be on the field so that we can calibrate. If you look closely, you may also be able to find a brown dwarf in this image. So in the image from earlier, the video from earlier, in order to spot that binary star and to be sure that it wasn't a speckle, I needed to wait for the Earth to turn and show you that whole rotation of the field. Here I am showing you a single 20 second exposure. So um, in the next image, I will actually circle it. So hopefully many of you have picked it out already. And there it is. Diffraction scales with wavelength. And so most of what you are seeing in this image is the diffraction pattern moving out from the center as the wavelength gets longer. Keras has an extremely broad wavelength coverage, almost a factor of two. And so you see this image expand over a factor of two in wavelength. This companion doesn't spread out because it's not part of the star's diffraction pattern. It has its own diffraction pattern that radiates out from the red circle. So now in a single 20 second image, I have the capability to make a detection and I have the spectrum of this object at all of these wavelengths. So I've really gained a remarkable amount, potentially at least, over what we could do with a simple imager. To apply this to um, the famous HR8799 four planet system, I'm showing the inner three planets here. This is what you can do um, if you just use the techniques in that movie earlier, where you wait for the rotation of the earth. If you also use that, but you add in the fact that I understand how diffraction works and I can use the diffractive scaling to distinguish companions from speckles, then you can do considerably better and you can pick out pretty clearly these three companions. So beyond just being able to find these objects, the power of imaging is being able to understand them. Here I'm showing you some synthetic spectra downsampled or smoothed to the resolution of Keras. This is not a high resolution spectrograph. And so if any of you are used to high resolution being 100,000 or something, this isn't it. And it's kind of funny. Um, people in spectroscopy might think of R of a few hundred as low resolution. The low resolution mode of Keras is R of 20, which depending on exactly how you want to think of it, isn't that far off from broadband photometry. Keras also supports a somewhat higher resolution mode. And so that's what I am showing here. And so the fact that I can't resolve individual lines doesn't matter when these molecular species have complex uh, families of lines, forests of lines, and they uh, blend into large scale spectral features. I'm showing you a temperature progression here. And you can see that at different temperatures, these spectral features really do look different. So I can learn about the temperature of a companion and I can also learn about the molecules that make it up. Finding molecules in um, exoplanet atmospheres 
has been around for a while. It's something that I think was first done um, more than 10 years ago anyway. To show how it uh, works for one of the simpler molecules to see, this one is methane. So I'm showing you now the transmission through, uh, this is one Earth atmosphere worth of methane now. Uh, this is the post-industrial amount. The pre-industrial amount was a little bit less. As I crank that up, the lines get deep and they also merge together. And so what you see is one of these broad um, spectral features where the light gets almost completely removed, long word of 1.6 microns, but there is a transmission window between about 1.4 and 1.6 microns. So if a companion is bright, at one and a half, 1.6 microns and faint at other wavelengths, then you have pretty good confidence that you have detected methane in its atmosphere. That's the level where we were, I'm gonna call it 10 years ago. So here's showing some actual models of exoplanet um, atmospheres at different temperatures, showing where methane becomes uh, chemically favorable and where at lower temperatures, you can hope to see it not even necessarily in spectra, but just in photometry. And we were able to do that about 10 years ago now um, in Gliese 504b, where on the left-hand uh, image, you can see the companion. It's in the uh, upper right at about one o'clock in that image. And at the wavelengths where methane should be absorbing everything, you do not see it. That's where we were maybe 10 years ago, but the field has moved on considerably since then. And so I want to contrast this, which was uh, a taste of the initial capabilities of really learning about these planets, to this. And this is where we are today. So a combination of, in this case, G pi on the top and really a game changer, gravity on the bottom, shows that now for these exoplanets, we're not playing that game anymore. We can see not just these broad spectral features, but we can go after the wiggles at much higher resolution that are caused by all of these molecular species and potentially even go after things like the C to O ratio or the ratio of uh, elements in the atmospheres that would then inform uh, the chemistry and uh, alter the chemical equilibrium of the different species that ultimately controls the opacity. The purple is theory and the black in the bottom is actual data. And it just blows my mind that we are able to do this now by combining all of the very large telescopes of uh, ESO into a huge interferometer. So we can do amazing things, but a lot of the images that I showed you were just of a few exoplanets. We haven't been able to do this on dozens or hundreds of exoplanets yet. And the reason is that this is really hard. We've spent, and when I say three years on big telescopes, I'm um, using that in the sense that if we had um, full use of a telescope for 365 nights, that counts as one year. So we've sunk between the various programs, at least I think around a thousand nights of big telescope time going for direct imaging. And the number of imaged planets, depending on your criteria who you ask, it's maybe a couple of dozen. So I am not doing it on this slide, but you can put a price tag on all of that. You can put the price tag on the instrumentation, on each night of telescope time, on the time of the scientists working on this. And it does not compare favorably at all to the Kepler satellite, which for something like half a billion dollars found 3000 planets. So directly imaged planets are in some ways more valuable, but still that yield has been disappointing and we've been trying to do better and we've thought we would do better for quite some time now. So in the rest of my talk, I'd like to tell you a bit about how I think we can finally start to turn the corner and actually begin to fix this. And also to combine astrometry and other techniques to really learn more about these planets and brown dwarfs in a way that wasn't possible until just recently. So astrometry, the precise measurement of positions uh, of objects in the sky has been a thing for a very, very long time. In fact, it's really astrometry that discovered Neptune, I would say, when Uranus was imaged in the late 1700s, then people followed its path across the sky very precisely 
and tried to model it using their understanding of Keplerian orbits and couldn't get the right answer with the uh, known planets. But they could fit for a perturbing body that turned out to be Neptune and get the right answer. So in some sense, astrometry as an exoplanet detection technique or as a planet detection technique has been very, very old. But for exoplanets, it hasn't been because the precision required is so high. And this satellite that I have up there now called Gaia has finally brought this um, out of the range of maybe some possibility in the future to reality today. So Gaia has just released or just performed its third data release. They have a very limited sample of um, actual orbits in there, but not very much at all. What they mostly have are positions and proper motions. The proper motions come from measuring positions many times and fitting a path across the sky. What we can do though is combine these results from Gaia with the Hipparchos mission that took place about 30 years ago. I'll tell you a little bit now about why that turns out to be such a powerful thing to do. So for that, I'll have a little bit of a pop quiz. I don't have a Zoom poll uh, um, set up so everyone can kind of decide to themselves. Um, no pressure here. I'm not gonna be uh, checking your answers. So how many proper motion measurements are there depicted in this figure? So I'll let that sit for about 10 seconds before giving my answer. How many proper motions or how many velocities in the plane of the sky am I showing? My answer is I drew two arrows, but there are actually three proper motions because there's this one, this green one, which is a change in position over a known gap in time. So with three proper motions, I have a significant amount of power to measure accelerations or changes, deviations from straight line motion across the sky. This long-term proper motion also has a huge advantage. So there's that uh, delta X in the numerator, but the denominator is 25 years roughly. So that means if I have an uncertainty in position, I get to divide it by 25 years to get an uncertainty in its proper motion. And so in that way, the, the astrometry from Hipparchos, even though it wasn't as good as Gaia, is extremely useful because of how far back it extends. Astrometry, as done by Hipparchos and Gaia, is special for another reason. These are measurements of the positions of the stars in an inertial reference frame because it's anchored by the fixed quasars, fixed as far as we are concerned. And so if I have deviations from uniform motion in an ref in, in inertial reference frame, that's what we talk about in the first couple of weeks in a, an introductory physics class. Deviations from constant velocity are accelerations and those need to be caused by some kind of a force. And so we turn to Newton and Newton says that the acceleration again in an inertial reference frame is just gm over r squared. There's no need to reference a reduced mass or a Kepler problem here because I am just following the motion of the host star, again, in an inertial reference frame, which is really special. Not too often you get to bring in, to, to base research like this on um, introductory physics material. There are subtleties, of course. Um, some of those subtleties we can handle a bit more realistically than others. Here's one example. The fact that Hipparchos and Gaia are not measuring actual instantaneous velocities the way a Doppler measurement is an instantaneous velocity. They're measuring many positions and then they're fitting a path to those positions. So if you were fitting a straight line path to all of the blue measurements, the blue measurements aren't points, they're ellipses because um, the way Hipparchos and Gaia work, they're better in one direction than another. They don't have um, the same errors in both directions. You would fit the black line. And so you do need to account for that uh, little bit of a distinct uh, subtlety that Hipparchus and Gaia are not measuring instantaneous velocities, but are indeed measuring some sort of an average velocity. But with that subtlety accounted for, yeah, it is just a velocity in an inertial reference frame. To give you an idea of the kinds of precisions that we are going after now, 
the typical acceleration precision that we are sensitive to is something like 0.01 milliard seconds per year squared around bright stars. So that's pretty small. And if you're used to thinking about radio velocities, it translates roughly to an acceleration of a couple meters per second per year at 40 parsecs. I'm giving you rough conversions in the bottom um, so that the mass we are sensitive to does depend on the separation. The more widely separated a companion is, the smaller the tug on the orbit. Um, it depends on how far away the star is. The closer the star is uh, to Earth, um, the more favorable the conversion between physical acceleration and angular acceleration. But roughly speaking, our astrometric precisions are now in the same ballpark as our radio velocity precisions, which is to me absolutely amazing. If we do have radio velocity for a system, then RV is going to measure the velocity and over time, the acceleration along the line of sight. And that, remarkably, is also in an inertial reference frame once we correct for the motion of the sun, which is a standard correction that all radio velocity teams do. They correct to the very center of the solar system. So that means that astrometric and radio velocity accelerations are two different projections of the 3D acceleration of the star, the host star in response to a perturbation. It's all just GM over R squared, nothing more. If I can also actually measure where that companion is, maybe it's much, much fainter than the star, but maybe with high contrast imaging, I can image it. Then I end up with three equations and three unknowns. And so we find ourselves at a point where cutting edge science in principle is applying these equations from first quarter or first semester of intro physics and then solving three equations and three unknowns to get the companion maps. So it's amazing. What could stop us? What could go wrong? And my answer is that there's an important thing I've left out to be able to do that. I've talked about how these are all velocities, accelerations, and an inertial reference frame. But are they? Are we sure? Had they really got the inertial reference frame right? And is it the same inertial reference frame for both Hipparchus and Gaia? These are all subtle things. Did they get their uncertainties right? Do I know what that means so that I can actually do statistics and trust them? Convincing yourself of all of these things turns out to be hard. And so I've spent a huge amount of work trying to do exactly that. I want to use these catalogs and just do naive things like take the difference in velocities, look for things that are accelerating interpret those accelerations physically. And so I need to be very confident in the underlying statistical integrity and compatibility of the catalogs. In order to do that, I am going to make the following hypothesis that most stars are not accelerating or at least not much so that I can model the uh, behavior on the sky as basically just systematics for a large fraction of stars. I can then ask whether the difference in proper motion for most of these is compatible with zero. Are these stars consistent, by and large, with constant proper motion across the sky? The answer is no, not if you just download the catalogs and use them as is. So here I'm showing you the difference between the Hipparchos and the long-term proper motion. That long-term proper motion, which I denote mu underscore hg, is much, much more precise. So in all cases, these distributions are broader than a unit Gaussian, which suggests that either there's a lot of acceleration and that it's basically the bright stars that are accelerating, or that the uncertainties in systematics are important and that the uncertainties are underestimated and most severely so for the brightest stars. So I would argue very strongly that the answer here is systematics and uncertainties. And I can argue that in part because we have other measurements of the accelerations of these stars, for example, by comparing the Gaia proper motions to the long-term ones. We see no sign that this behavior is actually real. It's something that we need to calibrate out in order to use the data. We see the same sorts of things in Gaia, between the Gaia 
uh, proper motions and the long-term proper motions. So we need to fix this. Um, and so a fair amount of my work over the last few years has been to try to do this in a thorough way and to release the results as something called that I call a catalog of accelerations. There are a number of tricks and subtleties. I'll summarize a couple of them here, but I won't get into them in gory detail. If you want the gory detail, well, the papers are there. Um, I'd also be happy to discuss some of that later. I do want to highlight a couple of them here and on the next slide. One is that these sky paths are fits to what they call the astrometric parameters, positions and velocities. If, for example, Gaia tells you the parallactic motion, the part of that uh, motion that varies through the year from the Earth's changing perspective, then you can go back and adjust your fit to the Hipparchos data and actually get better answers for things like the proper motions. So there are little tricks like that. And then um, the observational epoch varying star by star is the statement of the fact that, again, these are fits to sky paths. And that when you see Gaia, for example, reports all of its velocities, all of its positions at 2016.0, there's nothing magical about 2016.0. It's when Gaia has decided to just um, fix the center of its um, fit. But the best center for the fit actually varies star by star. And that's something that we do account for in the catalog. Finally, uh, something that I was not expecting when I jumped into this, there are actually two reductions of the Hipparchos raw data, three depending on exactly how you count. There were two teams that worked independently and had the results merged in 1997. That was the official European Space Agency catalog. Then one member of the team, Flora von Leuven, worked his butt off over the following 10 years and released Hipparchos II, which claimed much better precision. And that was published in 2007. So everyone basically has been using the Hipparchos II results. I wanted to ask which is best, and the answer, perhaps surprisingly, is uh, both. That if you mix these two catalogs, you actually do better than either one on its own. So the original two catalogs had their own different realizations of uncertainties. The new reduction is better, but it also has its own um, realization of uncertainties, treatment of systematics. And if you put it all together, you actually do a bit better than either one individually. And this is not something I can say tentatively. This is something that I can put, if I'm gonna put a sigma to it, um, it's at 150 sigma significance. Uh, the statement that this mixture of the two catalogs um, is more consistent with the Gaia data than either one on its own. So here I'm not accounting for uncertainties or anything in the horizontal axis. I'm just showing the difference between the Hipparchos and the long-term proper motion. And the more highly peaked this is at zero, the more consistent the Hipparchos and long-term proper motions are. And assuming we don't think that there are large scale accelerations across the sky, then a distribution that peaks more significantly at zero is better. And you can see even just by eye here that mixing the two catalogs together does do better than either one on its own. I'll show you briefly how this works for correcting an example field. This is shown for Gaia DR2, which is now almost four years old. Um, and some of the artifacts in DR2 have been removed in DR3. Some of them remain, some of them have been removed, but with asterisks. There are all kinds of subtleties that I'm um, still scratching my head about and still working through. And I look forward to more of them with the next Gaia data release. So if I just, blindly take the long-term proper motions and the Gaia proper motions and subtract them. Then, at least in a particular region of sky, I get this, where each arrow is showing the direction of acceleration. And the arrows tend to point up and to the right. So either there's some great attractor up and to the right, or this is a systematic. And the obvious answer is it's a systematic. So we can remove it. Uh, this frame rotation that is manifested here is something that the Gaia team um, acknowledged and came out with even when the data were first released, they characterized it uh, reasonably well. And it looks something like this. You can still see some offsets in the top right. So all is not quite well. We can do a little bit better. 
And so we have a locally variable correction and uh, we think we now have pretty good agreement. We do try to be careful through all of this, try to make sure that we're not overfitting and over um, interpreting our results. And so for that, um, I need to then check on how meaningful the uncertainties are and what I need to do with the uncertainties in order to be confident in using them in a likelihood formulation. If I'm going to fit orbits, compute accelerations, I want to say the acceleration is x plus or minus y. That means I need to be confident in the uncertainty. If I can't do that, I'm pretty screwed, actually, I would argue. Because if I don't know what my uncertainties mean, then I can't answer a basic question like, is this star accelerating and how much? So my approach to nail down the uncertainties for Gaia DR3 was to take advantage of the fact that radio velocity surveys have been ongoing for decades now. And that there's a large sample of stars that serve as RV standards that they're not accelerating towards us or away from us as far as we can tell. It's reasonable to assume that if they're not accelerating this way, they're not accelerating across the sky either. That would require quite a pernicious arrangement to have precisely no acceleration along the line of sight, but yet a significant one in the other way. That's unlikely. And so these radio velocity standards serve as not a perfect, but a very clean sample where I can be especially confident of my hypothesis that these stars should be uh, moving in constant proper motion across the sky. If I just take that as is, so my histogram here is only for a sample of RV standards, where I can say that they're not accelerating along the line of sight to a degree that is much more precise than the astrometric precisions. So these distributions don't look horrible, but they are broader than that unit Gaussian. In order to bring them into formal agreement, I need to assume that the, the excuse me, that the guy uncertainties are underestimated by a level of something like 35 or 40 percent, which is roughly in line with what you would expect, roughly in line with uh, Kareem El Badri's estimates based on parallaxes, and um, seems to bring things into now exceptionally good agreement with what we would expect. And I want to give a special shout out to the RV community's trend over the last decades to make all of their observations public, open source. Without that, this calibration would not have been possible. And so I am a beneficiary, a huge beneficiary of the movement to open source data. Gaia as open source data have been a huge beneficiary to that. And by releasing these data, I hope to give back just a little bit. This shows the precisions that we can ultimately obtain, uh, where the black curve is comparing the proper motion of EDR3 and the proper motion of uh, Hipparchus Sky, this long-term proper motion. If I get that acceleration, then the precision is roughly five micro arc seconds per year squared, which would convert to one meter per second per year at 40 parsecs. That's the one sigma uncertainty. So now astrometric trends are as precise as RV trends. And this was a huge improvement with Gaia DR3 over DR2 because of the addition of additional measurements and because of the increasing baseline. Because you're trying to measure the slope of a line, if you have a longer baseline of measurements, you can do a lot better. And so if you're used to thinking of your quality of measurements improving as the square root of the number of observations, then as you wait for a mission like Gaia, it's not just taking more measurements, but it's extending your baseline. And so you go not as T to the one half, but as T to the three halves. So a long guy emission is incredibly powerful for things like measuring proper motions or even more so measuring curvature in these orbits. And those will be um, really a bonanza with future data releases. So if you want to use these things, then they are published as the Hipparchus Gaia Catalog of Accelerations. So I've tried to do the dirty work for you to provide three proper motions in the same reference frame where annoying things like perspective acceleration, the uniform motion in um, real space is not uniform motion as projected onto a sphere. I've tried to take care of all of those annoying things that you can actually just use the catalog for orbit fitting. There are some notes of caution that I'm leaving there, but by and large, 
This is intended to be suitable for orbit fitting. Here, just to briefly show you what the residuals look like, um, they are now much, much closer to a unit Gaussian. And you can see that there's a bit of stuff in those tails. The bit of stuff in those tails is likely due to real accelerations. And so things now do look more, much more like a core that is the constant proper motion stuff and tails that are the interesting accelerators. For Gaia, it's even more uh, remarkable that there's still stuff in the core. But now, in order to show you a line that kind of looks like it goes to the points, if you look at this line, I put 70% of the probability into this core of presumably non-accelerators and 30% into this accelerating sample. So something like 30% of the Hipparchos stars seem to be undergoing non-uniform motion across the sky, being tugged by something. And to give you an idea of just what kind of significance we can get in some cases, I'm showing you now some planet hosts and some brown dwarf hosts where we can measure statistically significant accelerations now. So if you want to return to Pimense, for example, that has an eight sigma acceleration in Hipparchos Gaia. So you can have a much better constraint than the orbit of the outer planet now than you uh, could have previously. I'll come back to beta pick in HR8799 later in this talk, and I'll spend a bit of time on some of these brown dwarf hosts where the significances can be almost comically high, 100 sigma or more. So for these massive companions, even if the period is quite long, we're now at the point where we can get very, very precise mass measurements, where it wasn't possible until recently. Go to a paper published 10 years ago, and it, I read a couple of them, and they were not optimistic about the prospects of measuring or, or weighing some of these long period brand dwarfs. But now there's some of our very best ones to go after. Um, my group here at UCSB has provided tools to try to make this easy. And so if you are interested, then uh, you are most welcome to download these things and try them for yourselves. So the uh, results that I'll show in the last few minutes of my talk were overwhelmingly obtained using these tools. And if you have the data and much of the data that we've used is public, then you can do exactly the same thing. So here's an example, the first brown dwarf that was ever directly imaged. Period is a couple hundred years and people had been arguing over its mass for quite some time. In 2020, we could measure its mass directly using just Newton to be 70 plus or minus five Jupiters, almost a star. The uh, hydrogen burning limit is at something like 75 or 80 Jupiter masses. This was higher than we expected and too high for models of brown dwarf cooling to actually account for. We can compare this and other brown dwarfs and see if indeed these evolutionary models where you have a fully convective interior, you start hot with this initial heat of formation, you slowly radiate it away at a rate modulated by the atmosphere. Can these models explain the observed mass and luminosity at the approximately known system age? And for these three objects anyway, the answer is yes, they do pretty well. On the top is the mass that we measure from Newtonian dynamics. And that mass has pretty good overlap in these cases with a bunch of these evolutionary models that, mod, uh, that just map a simple interior to um, radiative loss through an atmosphere. For Gliese 229, it doesn't work so well. There's a bit of tension where the mass is high and the models have real difficulty explaining a mass of about 70 Jupiters. It was 70 plus or minus five. So maybe you got unlucky and it was actually 60, in which case then most of this tension goes away. But that was with the DR2 version. So before Gaia had the extra data and really nailed down the uh, detection to now it's 100 sigma. So here I'm showing you the improvement in the mass of Gliese 758b, one of these uh, brown dwarfs that was first imaged about 15 years ago. And this one is now, I think, around a 2% mass measurement. Kind of remarkable, even though its period is a couple hundred years. And for Gliese 229b, the 70 plus or minus 5 is now 
think it's 71 point something plus or minus 0.7. So again, we have a 1% mass of the brown dwarf, even though we've only seen it undergo something like 10% of an orbit um, since it was first discovered. So it's kind of amazing. And now this tension with the models has become um, pretty much impossible to explain away. There's the dynamical mass. And um, those two shaded areas are showing as far as you can possibly push it with two of the more popular models of brown dwarf uh, evolution. So there's too much mass there to explain its luminosity. One possible solution is that there's too much mass because some of it is actually in a companion to Gliese 229b to the brown dwarf. If you take 10 Jupiter masses away from 229b, then it all makes sense. Its mass is compatible with the models. And that 10 Jupiter mass, I don't know whether you want to call it a planet or a moon, um, is now so low in mass, it would have radiated its heat away long ago. You'd never, ever be able to see it. That's something that we could hope to detect. A planet or a moon, if you will, around this brown dwarf. And we're hoping to do so uh, using the radio velocity of the brown dwarf. We've traced its orbit to extreme precision, so we know what the velocity of the brown dwarf should be relative to the star. If it doesn't match our prediction, that's a sign that it's also undergoing motion around a Berry Center with a companion. And so we think we should be able to see this. And we are taking these data in about a month, although I have some intelligence from collaborators in Japan that maybe, just maybe, there are already signs that indeed it is a binary. And so we have a companion to this uh, first brown dwarf ever imaged. We can also target some of these accelerating stars to make new discoveries. So here's an example of a star we followed up because it wasn't you know, moving uniformly across the sky. We imaged a brown dwarf. And as soon as we did that, we were able to derive a dynamical mass. In this case, not as precise, but to a little bit better than 20%. We didn't have to follow an entire orbit the way you'd have to with um, RV trends. We were able to do that with this tiny little orbital arc of something that's on a, something like 60 year period. And that is new. We can also weigh some of the most famous exoplanets. So I showed you a few slides back, beta pick was a three sigma detection. For beta pick especially, it depends on exactly how you treat Hipparchos. Um, and so that's a little bit of a subtlety where different groups have made different assumptions. And I would argue that you have to be extremely careful taking the Hipparchos two uncertainties at face value. They're tiny for this star, but whether or not you trust that and they're willing to use it statistically is another thing. So with our formalism, we were able to fit beta pick B and beta pick C as a two body, uh, three body system and to account at least roughly for the interactions between them as a superposition of Keplerian orbits. So we convinced ourselves using rebound um, and a detailed simulation that this was okay and would yield the correct masses, we did the fit and we got sensible answers that both beta pick B and C are consistent with these so-called hot start models where the planets form and they form with basically their uh, gravitational potential energy intact, ready to be radiated away. And they don't lose all of this gravitational potential energy to radiation in the process of forming. That's been one of the big debates of our exoplanetary science over the years. And it's something that we can now speak to directly because we have these uh, direct measurements of the planet's masses can even play this game on HR8799, at least on the innermost planet. We know the orbits of all of these planets. And so if you're willing to make the reasonable assumption that um, they're all basically the same luminosity, they should have at least broadly similar masses. Then with that very minor, I would argue minor um, uh, assumption, we can say that the innermost planet is nine and a half plus or minus 1.9 Jupiter masses. So HR8799E, -E, that famous innermost planet in the four-planet HR8799 system can now be directly weighed. 
And this is applying to more and more planets and will only get better with future Gaia data releases. This is work done by my former student, Mirak, who unfortunately has just left the field to go work uh, for a uh, solar battery charging company. We can also, now that we have astrometry, if we also have RVs, we can take that game that people played with Uranus and Neptune hundreds of years ago and play it with exoplanets and brown dwarfs today. In some cases, we can take radio velocity and astrometry and predict where we should be able to image the companion and how massive it will be. So here's an example where we could predict the location of a brown dwarf. We go and observe it with Keck Nerf 2 and we see it exactly where we thought we would. So if you have um, an instrument that needs to know exactly where a companion is, if you have, um, oops, sorry, if you uh, have, there, I blocked it by chat, I'm sorry. If you have a companion, then you need to know exactly where it is, or if you have a field, and you can only take a small fraction of your field and make a dark hole. Now, all of these things are okay because you know exactly where to look. This is not an isolated case. Here's another example where we can predict a location and a mass before imaging. This one's gonna be a bit challenging for current generations of telescopes, but for something like an extremely large telescope, this is kind of the bread and butter of what they should be able to do where something at 16, 17 magnitudes contrast, 0.3 arc seconds, if you know exactly where to look, then you're all set. So you can apply these kinds of hardware techniques that would otherwise be unavailable to you. So I want to wrap up there. We have over 20,000, I think maybe even 30,000 accelerating systems today. Most of them are stellar binaries, but there's a treasure trove in there of um, planets, brown dwarfs, maybe even black holes, something that we've thought about a little bit, but haven't pushed as far as perhaps we could have. So based on that, my hope is that the golden age of direct imaging is finally on its way. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy for questions. So are there any questions online or in the audience? I have a question. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, uh, my name is Logan Pierce. Um, I have been working with the uh, Hipparchos Gaia Catalog Accelerations for a while. And then, so thank you very much for this amazing tool. I've already been using it and enjoying it. Um, you said that uh, a lot of these um, known brown dwarf companions had uh, significances of like 10 to the two, 10 to the three. Um, or 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2 um, sigma significances. I've noticed yes. some in the catalog that have like 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 uh, significances. And I was wondering how you interpret those, like things that are like 10, have a chi squared of like 10,000. Like, okay, you... so when I say sigma, I'm talking about the square root of chi squared. I see, okay. So uh, 10,000 would correspond to 100. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. So those are very obviously accelerating, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, the way I would interpret that is if chi squared is 10,000, then there's no way that these measurements describe constant proper motion across the sky. Right. Um, that could mean many things. It could mean that there's a stellar companion and that the light was blended in a way that completely mocked up the astrometry in one mission or the other. Um, it could mean that the proper motion that you're actually seeing is the motion of one of the two stars in one mission and of the photo center in another. And so actually using those in the case of a stellar binary is very tricky. A lot mm -hmm. of these very, very high significance results are going to be stellar binaries for which you can't make the assumptions that I've implicitly made throughout here that all of the light is from the star and so I am just tracing the sky path of the star in response to the tug of a companion. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many objects for which that is not a good assumption. And I would urge caution in yeah. trying to do orbital fits for those. Okay. Is there like an optimal range, do you think? Just... Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, okay. For something like Lisa 229, 
the chi squared is something like 10,000. It's of mm-hmm. order 100 sigma, but everything seems to hold together beautifully with just a simple orbital fit. So that's a case where 100 sigma is crazy significant, but that acceleration vector points in the exact right direction. So it's 100 sigma, but maybe that 100 sigma is actually trustworthy. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of other cases where the measurements are, the formal significance are similarly high, but the measurements are not trustworthy uh, for one reason or another. Maybe um, it's a blended star. And then there are other ones where the significances are much lower, where they're not trustworthy. So I think it kind of has to be on a case-by-case basis. Um, When you do an orbital fit, you also want to make sure that your fit is formally good, that the best fit orbit describes the data well, and that the chi-squared values for the best fit orbit are reasonable. If you don't pass that test, then it's pretty hard to trust the results, and you need to look for why it might have failed in that respect. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we have a question in the chat uh, from Oh, George. yes. Yes. So I skipped, uh, I skipped over this one uh, because I was down on time. Um, what I wanted to show here <laughs> is okay, that... I have Hippar- well, a question first. Sorry. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, the question in the so chat. So the question is, uh, I flipped through a slide that showed W first on it. What was that about? Um, and that was a keen eye because I didn't even write the words W first on this, but yes, indeed, W first or Roman was what I had in mind. So for the case of Hipparchos, it's less precise than Gaia by, for these stars, usually a factor of anywhere from 10 to 100. But it's still very powerful because it happened a long time ago. And so you get to take the position measurement and to get a velocity, you get to divide by a delta T. The longer that delta T, the more valuable it is for wide companions and gradual accelerations. You can think into the future and imagine playing the same game with something like W first or Roman, where if you can use these telescopes to get a single precise position far into the future, not too far, right? I think it's still on some kind of a schedule, then um, you can do the exact same thing, divide by the time baseline between Gaia and this future mission and extend Gaia's baseline out farther and be sensitive to even wider companions and lower mass wide companions. And so if you add this sort of position in 2030 and it only gets more powerful with time, the further you go into the future, the better it is. Um, And so it's one of those very rare cases where delays in the launch strengthen this science case, um, you can open up this discovery range, especially at these wider separations, 10 to 30 AU, and these very cold companions. You can start to actually measure the tugs that they exert on their stars if you can get this single extra position. Are there any more questions from the uh, online audience? I don't think so. Then a question from me. It's like, what can we add with ground-based telescopes? Like, oh, like maybe I, I was just thinking about some things like LSST. Will, they, will that be able to? I rather doubt it. LSST is good. I don't know exactly where they're going to saturate, but I know 15 sounds vaguely plausible. So maybe even fainter than that. So for something where Gaia does really well, let's say between 10th and 15th magnitude, LSST will be borderline useless. Hipparchos is starts to drop out around 10 or 11th magnitude. So the magnitude ranges here um, have a limited amount of overlap. Um, LSST will be able to help out a bit in a niche way probably, where for some of the fainter Gaia stars, it's gonna have a handful of very nearby M dwarfs, brown dwarfs, for example, let's say magnitude 16, 18. Those are ones where LSST could probably add some useful astrometry 
that's going to be a bit of a niche case, a niche case, excuse me, I think, because the magnitude ranges for Gaia is good and LSST is good are fairly disjoint. Gaia, uh, LSST is also going to struggle with astrometry just from the fact that it's a ground-based seeing limited instrument. And so it's not going to be able to achieve the astrometric precision of a space-based diffraction limited instrument. Okay, since there are no more, uh, oh, we have a question from uh, Andrew. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, so quickly. So obviously short arcs of orbits, if me measurements are precise enough, you can get very good orbits. Obviously this is done all the time in the Kuiper belt. Yeah. Um, what, what would be needed to get uh, orbital eccentricity uh, for, for this type of problem? For some of them, the eccentricities are already quite good in the same way, the same sort of thing as the Kuiper belt, where I think, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, here, I'm approximating everything as an instantaneous acceleration to show that it's just physics 101. But what you would really do is fit orbital arcs here because you don't have purely instantaneous accelerations. And so for the brown dwarfs that we have for something like Lisa 229, I don't think I have the acceleration plot here but the acceleration is known to a couple percent. So uh, the answer is that the same things that allow you to get a very good mass, as long as you cover at least some fraction of an orbit, which of course you cover some fraction of an orbit. Yes, you can get eccentricities that are pretty precise also. And for a lot of these brown dwarfs, we do have eccentricities that are precise to a few percent or even better. Great, thanks. Okay. Okay. I think that were those were all the questions, and we went uh, over time. So I think we can thank Tim again for, the, for this great talk, and we hope to see you all again next week.